I haven't heard anything all week long any better than that right there. I guarantee it. Amen. That's good. All right. I want to bring you a message this morning on the three genealogies of Christ or why he had to be virgin born. If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter number one. The three genealogies of Christ or why he had to be virgin born. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Father, bless this book now. In thy name I pray, amen. In 1 Timothy chapter number 6, in verse number 15, it's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. 1 Timothy 6, 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach into, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. The Bible here and there gives you a glimpse into eternity. And that's about all we can handle right now. A lot of folks believe they can wrap their mind around eternity. I cannot. I'm not one of them. I can't do it. I can't do it. There's no way in the world. Forgive me. I blow my nose up here. I cannot wrap my mind around eternity. There's no way in the world. But the Lord Jesus Christ came out of eternity. He came from eternity. When he came into this, into this world of time into the place of creation. He came from where it was uncreated. He came from the place of his glory and his majesty as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so in the book of John chapter number one, it said in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Not a God, but God. So now we've got one genealogy nailed down, and that neat genealogy has to do with the eternity, the eternal existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no mistake, any deviation from that is a pure heretic, pure heretic to the bone. The Lord Jesus Christ is from everlasting to everlasting. Well, when we talk about the incarnation, we talk about the time the, the, when he came from eternity into time. He came into where time is counted. And this is where we live. We're creatures of time. We did not come from eternity. We were creatures of time, have been until we're called into eternity. And so we have two genealogies that deal with time. And I want you to look at the two of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic Gospels. They teach that to young men when they go to a Bible college. Matthew and Luke are the two Gospels that record a genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you turn to Matthew chapter number 1, you'll have the genealogy of his royal line, of his, of his credentials, as to whether or not he is, as, as he's qualified to be the king of Israel. And then in the book of Luke, you have another genealogy, and the focus of that genealogy is entirely different than this one here in Matthew. So we have three genealogies of Christ and all three focus on different things. If you notice in Matthew chapter number one, it says in verse number one, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Well, now David lived about a thousand BC. You'll notice he's the son of Abraham. Abraham lived about 1,900 BC. So you'll notice that David is placed before Abraham, even though chronologically, Abraham was nearly a thousand years before for him. The reason for this is because the focus is upon the royal line. If you notice in verse number one, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now the question I posed to you just a moment ago is this, why the virgin birth? 
Well, for one reason, and the most important reason, is that the virgin birth was necessary for God to become flesh so that he could bear our sins and go to the tree and there die for us and make the atonement for the sins of mankind. And the only way that that could happen is for the word to become flesh, is for God to become flesh. Couldn't happen any other way. And so therefore it fulfilled the requirements by being a virgin birth. And the Lord Jesus Christ was born of the virgin. Isaiah 7, 14, Matthew tells you plainly that he was born of a virgin. But there's another reason for the virgin birth, and we're going to get into that this morning. You say, another reason? Yes, there's another reason for the virgin birth, but I want you to get the first one nailed down. And I think all of you have that, no problem, that the Lord Jesus was virgin born so that he could be the atonement for our sins and for the sins of all mankind. But don't you look at Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 16 now. Matthew 1, 16. And we follow this genealogy all the way down to Jacob. Look carefully now. Matthew 1, 16. And Jacob begat Joseph. Now Joseph, he's identified for us here. The husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So there's no question in who this Joseph is. This is Joseph, the, the husband of Mary. Now it doesn't say he's his father. Now Joseph is never called the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary called him that. But, the, but the, by the Holy Spirit never calls Joseph the father of Christ. But here's the thing. Here's the point. Don't want to get off my uh, focus here. And that is that the genealogy comes down to Jacob begetting Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. The wording is very important. And you'll see that uh, you'll see in a few minutes, and you'll see uh, why this is so important. Now, hold your place right there and go with me to the book of Luke chapter 3. Hold your place in Matthew because we're going to be going back to it. Luke chapter 3 and verse number 23. Luke chapter 3 and verse 23. Now Luke gives us a genealogy, but in this genealogy there's nothing about a royal line here. It traces the genealogy, if you'll notice, all the way back to Adam. And if you'll notice carefully what it says in verse 38. Luke chapter 3, verse 38. Which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of who? God. So how could he be? God's his father, that's why. God brought him into existence. Adam, of course, being so much like our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the first Adam. Christ is the last Adam. And there, there's an awful lot in that. But here's the point. Come back now to Luke chapter number 3 and verse number 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. See the wording? See how Luke words that? As was supposed. Luke does not call him the son of uh, Joseph. But look, this is important. As was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. All right, now immediately we've got a problem here. What's our problem? Anybody spot it yet? We got a problem. Go back to Luke, go back to Matthew 1, verse 16. Hold your place in Matthew 1, 16. And you've got Luke 3, 23 in one hand and Matthew 1, 16 in the other. Here we are at Matthew 1, 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary. All right, who was Joseph's father? What's it say in Matthew 1, 16? Jacob. But what does Luke say in Luke chapter number 3 and verse 23? Healy. Well, now, we've got a problem here. See? Well, it's not a problem. It's just something in the Bible that will open up and show us something wonderful. That's the way I approach anything in the Scripture. That on, on the surface of it, I can't figure it out quickly. Well, God's got something in it for us. So what is it? Well, most believe that the genealogy in Luke is the genealogy of Mary. And they believe that Joseph is called the son of Heli because he's a son-in-law. And in those days that that could very well have fit the pattern because you have to understand the, the Jewish culture of 2,000 years ago. But there's one thing for certain. Joseph did not have Heli for a father and Jacob for a father. One or t'other of them was his father. Amen. Now, if you look at Matthew chapter number one, you're looking at the genealogy of Christ and you're coming down to the royal line. In verse 18, it says in Matthew 1, 
The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Do you believe that? Amen. That's your virgin birth right there now, folks. That's your, don't worry about Alma or, or, uh, or, or all of the other words that uh, uh, Parthenon, all of that. Don't, you know, words are fine. But just what did Matthew say? What does he, how does he interpret it? That's the way he interprets it. All right, so now what, what's happening here? What, what's going on? Why is there two genealogies? Well, I believe it may very well be because of a curse that was placed upon the line of Jacob in Matthew 1. I want you to go back with me now. And I want you to go back and look at verse number 11 of Matthew chapter number 1. Matthew chapter number 1 and verse 11. And Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren. Now who is this? Well, if we read over here in the book of Jeremiah, you'll read, and he has something profound to say. Here's what he says in Jeremiah 22 about Jeconiah. He says, as I live, saith the Lord, though Coniah, he dropped the yeh from it, Jehovah, he dropped that from his name, and said, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand. In other words, my own authority to stamp something. He said, yet would I pluck thee thence, O earth, earth, earth. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For, watch this now, no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Hold on. Wait a minute. Of course, Matthew's fully aware of this. Matthew's fully aware of it. Therefore, if the Lord Jesus Christ had been a physical descendant of Joseph, in other words, Joseph had been his father, he would have been disqualified from being the king of Israel because of the curse that had been placed upon that bloodline. There's no way it could be. It couldn't happen. God would not allow it. So it would become absolutely necessary that the Lord Jesus Christ be virgin born. And by being virgin born, two things happen. Number one, in Matthew chapter number one, Joseph adopts Christ as his son. Publicly, he receives him. This is his son. So he's adopted in the sight of the people. Therefore, he becomes a legal right to that throne that is handed down in Matthew chapter number one, although he is not a physical descendant. And if he had been a physical descendant, as I said a moment ago, he would have been disqualified. But God said to David, there shall never cease to be a son, one of your sons that sits upon the throne of David. So what do we got? We go to Luke and we have the genealogy of Nathan. We go to Matthew, we've got the genealogy of Solomon. The king, the, 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 the order of the king came through Solomon and Matthew, but because of the curse upon Caniah, it went to Nathan and, th and therefore through Mary. So what we've got, we've got Christ with two claims, two claims to the throne of Israel. Claim number one, he is given the legal right as a, as, as a king of Israel by being adopted by Joseph in Matthew chapter number one. But he has a covenantal right as the king of Israel through his mother Mary. For God, remember, shall never cease to be a son that sits upon the throne. So he's got a double uh, endorsement from Almighty God that he's the king of Israel. Yet he had to be virgin born in order to qualify to do that. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Only God does stuff like that. So when I look at that, I say to myself, this is remarkable because we're in a conundrum. That's what, this is a conundrum. You get in a situation where there's no real, you, you can't find an immediate obvious answer to it. How do you work this problem out? How do you fix this? And but the Holy Ghost had already fixed it. And he'd looked at it years and years and decades and centuries before and had laid it down and it was ready when Christ was born. So she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Hallelujah to God. Now everybody knows about the baby. 
And everybody knows about the time that he was a, he was a, he, when he had his bar mitzvah, they call it son of the law, uh, and all that. But there was silent years there from the time of about 13 until 30 that there's nothing, nothing recorded in the scripture about Christ. Not a word. Not a, not a, not a thing. There was a Russian who wrote, uh, who wrote a book about in the 1800s about Christ and said that he was, had gone off into India and into, into Tibet and into the, into the monasteries and, and, and the gurus and into the swamis and, and, and all the rest of them. And he had been taught magic. Well, this is exactly what they teach in the, in the, in the, in the Quran about Christ. Not, not the Quran, the, 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 uh, the, the Talmud. The Quran the, is the, uh, is the uh, Muslim book. The Talmud. They teach that what Christ did, he did it by the power of Beelzebub magic. All right. Now, this is where we are today. We have people today that are claiming to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are merging the truth of Scripture with magic. They're merging it. And we have all this stuff about avatars today. You know what an avatar is? An avatar is supposed to be a manifestation of a God, some sort of a manifestation of a God. So what we have is a perversion, a perversion of the truth and that perversion of the truth comes by taking an element of the truth and then twisting it and distorting it. The worst lie you will ever hear is a lie that says God doth know. In the day you take this fruit and eat it, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He told the truth, but he didn't tell all the truth. He told a deceptive, he had made an, a deception of it, the truth. So here we are today, folks, I want to warn you. I want to warn you. Jesus Christ is unique to himself. There's never been one before like him. There'll never be another again like him. There's only one like him. When he went to the cross and he died on the tree, I want you to think about what I'm about to say to you now. I want you to think long and hard on it. It is utterly impossible for God to die. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that? God cannot die. He cannot die. But the Lord Jesus Christ bowed his head and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so his spirit was commended into the hands of the Father. His body died. But he was separate from that body. So the body lay alone for three days in that tomb. Three days. His soul descended into the heart of the earth and there he, there he uh, led captivity captive and did all that God uh, intended for him to do there. But his body was lying cold in the grave now after three days. It did not see corruption. The Bible's very clear in the book of Acts chapter number two. Thou wilt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. No corruption set up in his body. That's another thing you can think about because that introduces something else. But we'll deal with this right now. His body lay in that tomb for three days. He said, I have power to take it up. I have power to lay it down. The Lord Jesus Christ came back to that body. And he entered into that body in a way that he had not before. Because you see, when he was incarnate in the virgin's womb, he came into the virgin's womb and God incarnated himself in flesh. That had never happened before. That was a one-time thing. Never had happened before. Never will happen again. But when he came back to that body, he entered into that body. And by entering into the body, he gave authority approval and mark to that body that this is the son of the living God. The Bible said he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Now think a minute. Have I got you thinking? Who was dead? The body was dead. He wasn't dead. See? Think on that. He wasn't dead. The body was dead. But it separated him from his body. You say, why is that important? 
Because once the Lord Jesus Christ incarnated himself in flesh and was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, that'll never change. The Lord Jesus Christ will forever bear the marks in his hands of the cross. He will forever bear the nail prints in his feet. In plainer words, the God-man now, the God-man will forever exist throughout eternity into eternity of eternities and nothing will ever change about that. And that all started in the womb of a virgin. Did God ever change his nature? No. He did not change his nature. But what he did by doing that is made it possible for you and me, you and me, to bear the image of that almighty being, that image that was lost when Adam sinned. And the Lord Jesus Christ came. He was the express image of God. The Bible said express. He's the exact image of the Father. This is something that God has for us. It's not, you know, a lot of folks say, well, I'm going to move in, keep house, and we're going to, I'm going to have a nice car, and we're going to have, plant me a garden, and everything's going to be okay. Well, that's good for you, but I don't think that's what God's got in store for us. I think what he has in store for us is something that is on a much higher plane, a much higher plane. I really do. Much higher plane. Much, 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 much higher plane. So it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when, when he appears, we, we shall be like him for we see him as he is. The Bible said we see through a glass darkly, darkly, but then face to face. Thank God for the incarnation, folks. Amen. Incarnation. He's not unincarnate. He's incarnate. And for three days, that body, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Now, I've done some thinking on what went on when he entered into his body. And uh, there's some thoughts on that. And I'm not going to try to get into them this morning because there's some, there's some things in there that, that are very, very, very interesting. Um, you know, when the first Adam came up, he came up from the ground. And when he came up from the ground, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living soul. So the first Adam's body was made from the dirt, Right? <coughs> And the last Adam was, uh, was uh, the Bible said the first Adams of the earth, earthy. The last Adam was the what? Lord from heaven. The Lord from heaven. So what kind of a body did he have? The Bible said he took, likewise took part of the same. I swear it's so quiet in here. You could hear a mouse jump around. But that's good. That's good. That's what, that's what, I, want to, that's what I want you to do. It's in, the Bible's a beautiful book, folks. It really is. It's a wonderful book. It's got some powerful, powerful things in it. When the Lord Jesus Christ appears, I'll guarantee you one thing. We're going to shout and we're going to glorify God. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Father, thank you for the little time we've had this morning. Forgive me the strength to do what I've done. I know I've posed some things, just kind of cast them out before people to think about. But Heavenly Father, I hope that what I said about the, about, the, uh, in, about the genealogies and the incarnation and the virgin birth, I hope that sticks with them. And they realize, our Heavenly Father, there's such a great truth buried until it was needed to be known and that it came forth. I pray for that in Jesus' name. For his sake, I ask it this morning. And amen. All right.